August 7, 2014. My name is Kyle Huckins, and I am interviewing Felix Gutierrez for the AEJMC Diversity Oral History Interview Project. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, for agreeing to this interview. Thank and you. Please note that it will be housed at AEJMC Archives in Columbia, South Carolina, or at the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison, Wisconsin. And we'll also post the interview on the Internet. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about how you got involved in journalism. Well, I got involved in journalism because my parents had been involved in journalism uh, in the 1930s as a student activist, college student activist for Mexican-American civil rights. My mother in Arizona, Arizona State, uh, she was a founding member of Los Conquistadores, which was in 1937, which was a group to get more Mexican kids onto campus and get more of the uh, campus presence into the community. And my dad uh, was at, in Southern California and uh, grew up in Monrovia, was going to Pasadena Junior College, and with some others founded a magazine called The Mexican Voice. And it was uh, an inspirational educational magazine. That's the way they built it in 1938 to inspire young Mexican kids to, you can do more than you know, pick oranges. There's value to education, and you can do this. And it, it, the magazine under that name and under a later name as a newspaper continued until uh, 1950. So they were involved in journalism, and that's how they met. I tell my students there's a romance in journalism. My mother started writing articles about what they were doing in Arizona, submitting them to the publication. My dad would publish. It was a mimeographed uh, uh, magazine. And uh, then they met, fell in love, and so I'm a product of uh, journalism. Um, I would watch my dad when he, was, he became a school teacher taught art and journalism in the 1940s and 50s and would watch him as he advised the school yearbook at the junior high level and saw him do things and it looked like fun, interesting to do. Uh, I was you know, elementary school. And then he passed away, he had uh, cancer of the colon and died when he was 1955. So he didn't, I didn't continue seeing him do things. But later when I was in junior high, later in junior high and then into high school, I don't think it was because of my dad, but because it was something I thought I could do. I said, I'd like to get involved into, in journalism. So I took it, uh, took print shop and, and worked very hard in my English class as a high school sophomore to get into the journalism newspaper. And the English teacher said, you write pretty well, you ought to get into journalism or try journalism. So I started in high school and uh, worked on the school paper and then went to college, Cal State Los Angeles. Uh, worked on the paper there, did not major in journalism intentionally because I could not see very many or any real Latinos in, uh, in newspapers, not, nobody on TV. And uh, there was a couple of sports writers and that was it. So I didn't want to get a degree in a field where I couldn't get, uh, wouldn't be able to get a job. This was 1961 when I started uh, college. Uh, so I majored in social studies so I could be a teacher and then teach journalism. And then I worked on the school paper at Cal State LA for four years, all four years of my undergraduate, edited the paper, and it was chosen the best paper daily in California that year, and it was beating USC and Berkeley and all these you know, big time schools. It was a big deal. I completed my uh, credential, you do four years and then a credential, and then so I had my BA, my credential, and then I said, well now I can, I got that education thing in the bank, I'm all set. Let me do what I really want to do. So I went to Northwestern in 1966 and got a master's degree in journalism at the Medill School, and uh, was ready to hit, you know, get a job. And look, it was the during the Vietnam War, and they were we were draft eligible, so there was a little bit of what's your draft status when you went for interviews and such. But when I got out, I, uh, I applied both for teaching jobs that would allow me to teach social studies, my undergraduate major, and uh, journalism and uh, newsroom jobs and got no offers anywhere uh, where I could use my journalism education. I got one teaching offer in 1967 to teach history in Pomona. I got nothing in the newsroom. So I uh, took a job back at Cal State LA where I'd been, after being editor, I'd been student body president. And I uh, started with others, a thing where students would volunteer. It's called service learning now. but 
we didn't have that term in 1966, uh, where students would volunteer to do tutoring and community service work. So they, they hired me. And uh, I wanted to do journalism. I didn't, uh, higher education was not my goal. I had a great college career, I guess, as a student, and then didn't see, you know, it was time to move into something else. Um, so I did what I could. Getting involved with uh, La Raza a newspaper was an alternative underground advocacy, in your face type newspaper. I took pictures for them, wrote for them. I did media relations. This is the period of the walkouts, the Chicano movements, the student activism, 67, 68, 69 were very high. So I became kind of a media intermediary, worked with people like Ruben Salazar, trying to pitching him stories. TV, Time Magazine, radio reporters, not being on TV, but being, oh, you want to know about police brutality, here's somebody who's uh, running a center on that, or what are the students asking for? So I got into dealing with media and got a totally different view from what I had learned. Most reporters were taking the stories as spot stories, you know, there's a demonstration here, there's a picket there. They'd come out and they'd cover what we were doing, but not why we were doing it. You know, yeah, we're protesting the school, so they want to, you know, they want you to be holding your signs up and chanting and all these kinds of things, so it'd be good TV. But you know, we're doing this because of that. And also, I was dealing a lot with media. Actually, my next job after the school year, the Cal State LA job, I worked for the anti-poverty program in press relations. So I knew a lot of media people. All the reporters were calling me producers for the TV, and they all claimed they were looking for people of color. They were just starting, this is right after the Kerner Commission report of 1968. But I never never connected with anything. So in 69 I decided if I can't get into the newsroom and make an impact in the newsroom, maybe I can make an impact on the newsroom by becoming a journalism professor. It sounds like that you were always conscious that there was a an issue of race as far as journalism was concerned because of your father's work and not seeing Hispanics in the field, for example, but was it really at that time after graduating from the Dill that, and not being able to get any offers despite having really good credentials that you said, hey, we need to have more diversity as far as uh, journalism, try to knock down the walls? Well, it was really an integration generation. You showed who you were, you knew who you were racially, but you couldn't play that card in the, start of the early 60s with the whites. You know, if they could get the Mexican label on you, it would only be putting you down. So you showed you could work in a white world. You know, I mean, the term Mexican American really is, fits. We were Mexican for part of our life, or what we knew of being Mexican, because we, you know, I never lived in Mexico. And then we, we had to show you could make it in an Anglo world. Um, and in most of my life, and it's generational, it's not me for qualifications, I've been either the first or the only Latino uh, doing what I was doing. When I was editor of the school paper elected in 1964, I was the first non-white to be uh, um, named editor of the paper. And I wanted to have a black person follow me. So I appointed a black individual, um, Charles Bonner. I'd offered it to Clint Wilson, but he was gonna play baseball. It was, and uh, he was in next in line to become the editor. So I saw that I knew there was a need for us to break in and break through, but it was by showing people you could do things just as good as anybody else, and then putting in some Latino or racial stuff where you could, but it wasn't your calling card. When I came out in 67, uh, I didn't attribute it to race. I didn't know, and maybe it, that may have not been a factor anyway, but it was when I saw the news media come out and try to make sense out of what was going on in the, the turbulence and the activism and seeing them. I mean, so you get the reporter there and then sometimes you wish they hadn't come. Other times they do a good job. Uh, so that made me understand that there was a, a larger uh, agenda that needed to be raised. And of course, with the Kerner Commission in 68, all of a sudden we had the federal government, or at least the federal government rhetoric on our side. You had federal Communications Commission asking for uh, racial uh, information on uh, hiring and broadcasting. You have uh, license challenges, petitions. Uh, I went to a training program at a KNX radio. It was a one 
one night a week for three weeks or something where they said it was a minority training thing and I'm sure it was a license renewal year. My guess is they were putting that to show they were doing that. So uh, it was a time of heightened racial awareness. Media had always been an issue for us, but we had not always been an issue for media. And I think that was the difference. So then I said how to make an impact and thought journalism education would be the way for me. What was your mindset as you got into the academic side of this and teaching? Was it, well, it was hard for uh, my generation to be able to break in, but maybe this next generation will be able to make that uh, kind of impact and these kind of inroads? Was that some of your thinking as you went into that field? No. It was, it might be easier for the next generation if I do what needs to be done. I mean, I, I had the, the fortune or misfortune of seeing both sides of the coin. I was there when you could be fully qualified and not get a job. And then when the 68, late 60s, 68, 69, when affirmative action starts, I was there where the, your best calling card was to be a minority in some cases. I got hired at Stanford as an assistant dean when they were admitting their first large class of Chicano students in 1969, uh, you know, because they needed a Mexican-American who could work with these students who had some experience in higher education. Two years earlier, I couldn't get hired to teach junior high or high school. So that's, you know, that's just a two-year period. So we saw these doors opening, and we knew they were going to be open for a short time. We always knew there were qualified people there. You just couldn't get a chance. So it was kind of you grab the opportunity while you can, learn what you can learn, you know, and, and I did learn a lot in the PhD program, which I went into the next year in 1970, uh, but use it to advance what's important to you or to us. And uh, it was that approach. You had to show, and there was a question mark. We don't know if these students of color can, you know, cut it with us. This is PhD work. This is very demanding. This is on and on and on, all the things we weren't supposed to be. So you had to pass the test, take the classes write the papers and all that, but then take that knowledge and then use it to advance uh, knowledge of who we were and what our media history and experiences were. Um, and that was pretty much my Stanford experience. There was a lot of contentiousness in the department, but we got out, we got our degrees. <laughs> we went on. And there were some faculty that helped us, I want to say there were. It's really, you were in uh, academia at the time when things began to break, and so that was why you kind of stayed in academia and made that kind of an impact. Well, it was, but I'd made a conscious decision. I mean, I, got, I, I could have gone back to L.A. and said, well, look, the doors are opening now. You know, Ruben Salazar was, left the Times, went to KMEX. Uh, you know, they're going to look. So, but I just said, no, I'll, I'll, be a, I'll be a professor. I've made that choice. Um, so let me see where, the, where this road will take me. And, uh, and that's what I've stuck with. And you mentioned uh, that uh, one of your best calling cards at that point became being Mexican-American, being a minority, et cetera. Did you see, though, that there were still issues of diversity in higher education, even though there began that sea change around the change of the 60s to the 70s? Well, there's a difference between integration, well, assimilation, integration, and full participation. Assimilation is kind of forget who you are, you know, melting pot becomes something different. Uh, and we had rejected that. Integration was, you know, you've been in this lower status. We're going to open the door for you so you can come up and be like us. You can work, right. and that's the mentality that I was. Uh, that offered opportunities to him, but also confronted with. So we're going to teach you how to do this, this, and this. And then you say, well, that's good, I can do this, but I want to study Spanish language radio, which is what my dissertation was. Well, they're kind of, well, hey, you know, we just kind of got you out of that. You know, why do you want to go back to that? I remember one professor telling me at Stanford when I was finishing or writing my dissertation, or should have been writing my dissertation, he says, why are you studying Spanish language media? That's a dying medium in 1974, which is turned out not to be the case. Well, this is media I'd grown up with. These are experiences I had had. So there was a tension and that, yeah, they'll let us in to be like them. We want to say, let us in so we can be like us. And the power of getting a PhD, the power of getting an advanced degree and being a professor is you get to define knowledge for others. 
you get to, you know you go look for stuff you don't know what you're going to find but when you find it you can package it and put it together because it has professor in front of your name and PhD at the end of your name people pay attention to it and that was it the hard part for me there were people who were supportive Felix go ahead and do it there were others Felix why would you want to do that but there was no senior level of scholars there were no up the line people you know I talked to Wilbur Schramm who was a professor at Stanford well known in communication education I asked him he said because I've heard if anybody knew he would he said well he knew a guy in Arizona who had done work on radio in Mexico and that was the closest you know to Spanish language radio and he did he did contact the guy so it was kind of breaking the field open not knowing what you were going to find uh, but going in and saying well whatever it is it's going to be valuable and then when I started teaching journalism, my first job in 74 was at Cal State Northridge. I didn't want students to have the experiences that I had had of being ready, willing, but unable to enter in the newsroom. And the Chicano News Media Association, California Chicano News Media Association, had started two years earlier. It was the token hires at the different TV stations of paper. They would cover to the Chicano stories and they got to know each other. And they were doing scholarships and stuff, so they asked me to work with them. And through them and through others, I took on an advocacy role to uh, let people you know, open doors for students who, would, when they graduated, would have better opportunities than I had had. And it sounds like really diversity always was uh, your focus to some extent in scholarship, um, but you had a lot of people who were saying, "No, don't don't pursue the diversity angle." It's your going through and doing your studies. Now, it wasn't so much don't as kind of why would you, you know, because well, here, you know, we've had this field called communication. We have this field called, we've been existing all these years, you know, and we've never, you know, if it was anything important to look at, we would have found it, you know, basically. It was, I mean, they didn't say that, but that was a kind of why would you do that? And also, they couldn't help you. You know, the mentoring and the, you know, the senior faculty helping somebody through their dissertation because they have knowledge in the field of what you're you're going through was a relationship we didn't have. I had people invested in me, I had, a, I had a good committee, but they couldn't tell me anything about the radio. I had to figure that out myself. So it was that kind of, you know, you know, we know this, why don't you do a version of this? Whereas you're saying, no, you know, I, I know what you want me to know, and I've shown that I can do what you want me to do, and I want to apply that over and do this. And I was very surprised by what I found. I, it, it shocked me when I started doing the research. Things that I, I didn't know and others didn't. I mean, the textbooks that others were writing had to be rewritten based on findings that I'd come across using Mexican and some U.S. sources on the history of journalism in Latin America, which antedated uh, journalism in the English colonies by more than a century. Printed newspapers, you know, there was, I didn't know that it all started in Mexico. And a lot of the dominant ideology or dominant races tend to keep those truths hidden, don't they? Because of that idea of perpetuating, well, yeah. it's just a general field. Don't go into these particular racial, cultural, minority kinds of applications. Yeah, I mean, I don't even knew they knew. I, I didn't know what was going on. I'm sure they didn't know. Although I'd found other, there had been people that had written. I mean. Uh, uh, there had been histories that referenced it, but it was kind of like a footnote that there was printing in Mexico in 1535. The first ink press in the English colonies was 1638, more than 100 years later. And, you know, they just kind of like a footnote, but it didn't really affect. Well, if you look at the Southwest, or what became the Southwest, that's where those newspapers and the, they, their, their traditions came out north. You know, they didn't come from east to west. They came out of that tradition. And there was printing in the Mexican, Texas, New Mexico, California, prior to the arrival of the Yankees. You mentioned, too, uh, going to Northridge and taking on that advocacy role with uh, young Latino journalists. Uh, has diversity always been a major emphasis also in your teaching aspect of this, too? Well, I knew that I'd gotten in to a Ph.D. program. I don't think it was a factor up until that point because I was Mexican-American. I knew that was a factor. 
So what am I going to do? Get this degree? Yeah, I made it, you know, and then forget all about, you know, being Mexican, you know, which would have been okay, I think, for some people. Yeah, that was fine. You know, we let you in, and that. Was just... So I and I wanted to teach journalism. I thought it was important for us to integrate the mainline departments. So when I went to work at Northridge, I was hired in the journalism department, and I told the chair that I didn't want to teach all of my classes in journalism. I wanted to teach a class in Chicano studies. They had El Popo in the Chicano newspaper there. I said, I'd like to work with a paper. The person advising it had been a student. He was a professor there now. He'd been a student at Cal State LA when I was working there. And he was glad to, well, not Raul Ruiz, he was glad to let someone else take it over. So they did a split time arrangement. Well, my home department was in journalism. All the tenure and all that stuff had to go through that. But they, the Chicano studies bought a portion of my time. And through that, then I was able to you know, work in the advocacy, alternative media, as well as the, the mainstream media that there's a journalism orientation. Over the years, most of my students have not been Latino. Most of the classes I've had have not been defined as minorities or Latino studies or diversity or stuff like that. You know, I taught journalism history and mass media and society and research methods and theory and all these things that, uh, that you need to, you know, that you need to be able to do. But my work is focused primarily on areas related to race, ethnicity, uh, and other forms of media, including gender and sexual orientation. Has it also uh, been true of service? Of course, you've uh, held offices in the EJMC, different things like that through the years as well. Well, I, uh, I got into, I joined AJ in 1972. There was a minorities division Activision that I could join. Lee Barrow and others had put it together. And it, and it was not all people of color. It was, there was a lot of white professors who were involved in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination, the Kerner Commission report, and Lee's presentation at the Chicago Convention in 1968 basically a challenge to this organization to get serious about it. So by the time I joined in 72, there was a division that had a newsletter still here. So that was very helpful to me for AEJ to have that, because at Stanford, I and a few couple other guys, we thought we were the only ones that cared about anything about race. And then you start getting this you know, monthly newsletter called Still Here, and it was mainly black, but it was about racial issues in the media, and it was somebody's doing this. And, you know, and all you say, hey, there's a larger pool out there, and I think a lot of us were isolates. You know, we were the only person here in this program or that program or teaching and such. I remember going through the AEJ directory when I first joined the first years and looking for Spanish surnames uh, and not finding them except for those who were from Latin American universities. Is there anybody else like me out there? I later found out while I was still a graduate student there was Joe Lewis at uh, UT El Paso who did not have a Spanish surname, was Chicano and was doing similar things. He was getting his PhD at Missouri. So well, at least there's one other person, you know, with the same interest that I have that's uh, out there doing it. So it was, um, how shall I say it? It was um, like being lonely, uh, but not wanting to be alone. And uh, wondering, is there anybody else that cares about this? So I'm not sure if that got to your answer. But that, uh, well, yes, and uh, be involved in the early days of Mac. Uh, certainly very influential, so influential uh, division in the AEJ MC. Well, that was my entry point into AEJ. You know, you couldn't get to, I think it's still that way, you can't get your way paid to the convention unless you're on the program. So in 76, I wanted to get in, so I contacted uh, um, Samuel Adams. Sam Adams was a professor, African-American professor at Kansas, and he was the one in charge of the so I was calling him to, you know, can I, I how do you pitch a paper? I, you know, I hadn't done anything like this. And I remember he called me back, he was on the road, he was traveling with a Gannett van. And I told him, I have an idea for a paper. He's going, yes, and I'd like to do something, yes. And I think, I, if that doesn't work, I have another paper that maybe I could write about this. He's going, yes, and, you know, and finally, and I'm waiting for him to say, you know, you're in or you're out. And he goes, so I said, well, what do you think? And he goes, Yes, I've been saying yes all the way. <laughs> we want you to be on the program. <laughs> yes, that's what I've been saying. 
So I went to my first convention at uh, uh, University of Maryland in 1950, 1976. And there it was, you know, in a room with a lot of people like you. Again, not uh, predominantly black and white, but, uh, you know, open. In those days, Latinos, Chicanos, Mexican Americans, when we encountered blacks, we never knew, uh, you know, because they were coming out of the civil rights experience. They were coming out of the urban rioting and such. And some of them were out of the South. And, you know, for them, it had always been a black and white world. Well, out of California, we'd had, I'd grown up with Asians and whites and Latinos and blacks and all that. Uh, but the AEJ people, at least the African Americans and some of the whites, were, couldn't have been more welcoming. They saw this as a wider movement. It should not be a black and white division. And they wanted, you know, Native American and Asian, and, you know, if we had, we had something to say, fine, we'll give you a chance to say it. Lee Barrow was, and uh, Sam Adams were especially helpful to me in getting connected. And that was our entree into the, how the power structure worked. Because we didn't, you know, we didn't know how this worked. You know, we didn't, I thought you just went to school and got your degree and then you went out and got a job. I didn't understand the mentoring and the, you know, you establish relationships and, you know, people kind of shepherd you through. And I had a good chair at Northridge, Ken Duvall, who later became president of AEJ. And he's kind of said, well, fine, you know, you're your class, but here's the way the system works. You get involved in this division, you get appointed to be the this committee, and then you become the chair of the committee, you know, this kind of, well, you know, they didn't, they didn't teach that. Without him, I wouldn't have known how that thing worked. I just thought you joined and you were, you were there. What kinds of challenges have you had over the last generation, basically, after you got your feet wet in these different ways, academia, service, teaching, uh, research, in trying to promote diversity or diversity related? Well, I think the biggest challenge is, uh, is First of all, it's being able to produce. A lot, I, a lot of the feeling I got at the beginning is, Felix, we know you can sing, now let's see if you can dance. So, you know, you could raise, you know, point and figure, okay, but you know, if you say we're not hiring enough people, do you have people we can hire? You know, that kind of thing. And you have to be able to, you have to be able to deliver. You know, I could talk, well, you guys aren't paying any attention to anything about Latinos or uh, diversity on your history classes. Well, where's the information? You know, you go, you got to be able to, to bring it up. And in the early days, there were very few. There weren't any doing anything in Latinos except for Lules and, and I. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like a, like I said, like a little footnote. Now there's a lot of people doing much better work. You know, we had to do the foundation work. To what was the first newspaper? How did radio start? What was Spanish language TV's history? Things like Nobody had ever done that. What roles did it play in our community? So now that's, but now the, this next generation can can build on that and take it beyond, and if they find mistakes we make, they can correct those errors. Um, so part of it was just to establish, yeah, we, you know, we may be new to you, but you're not new to us. You know, journalism, now, we've been doing journalism since, you know, uh, 1541 on this continent. That's all we've been doing. There's been, you know, Latino newspapers coming out daily, you know, for, for years. One of them just celebrated their 100th anniversary last year. So saying we have a presence, and it's a presence that's separate. You have this world that you're kind of letting us into now, and we have this world that we've been doing. The challenges have been that you, you feel very lonely, you know, alone and lonely, when you're out there doing it and you don't know what you're going to find or if it's going to be of interest to others. And that's where AEJ and my initial faculty cohorts at Northridge were very helpful. Mike Emery and Tom Riley, who edited journalism history, was uh, headquartered there. And, and Tom asked me, can you do a history, we can do an issue on journalism history on Latino, Spanish language media in the U.S. Can you edit the journal? I'm just an assistant professor. And I said, sure. I had no idea if I could. But you don't say, if you're assistant, you, know, you don't say no to 100% sure publication. And I found that it came out in 1977 and there was enough chapters and stuff. And I still see the works that I and others produced for that issue um, cited. So it was being able to take the opportunity and make something out of it. Go beyond rhetoric and talking. With uh, hiring, it was more, a little more difficult 
because the rhetoric was that there's nobody qualified, can't find anybody qualified. And there, and again, there, there were some heavy hitters on the African-American side, uh, Bob Maynard, Nancy Maynard, uh, Jay Harris, uh, um, and I was kind of the Latino. Well, I'd be on these panels. Uh, I used to call them the Black and Tan Review because they'd have the black person <laughs> and me. And it'd be Bob Maynard or Nancy or Jay or somebody like that. And, and you know, they'd always say they can't find anybody qualified. Well, then you toss it back. Well, where did you look? Well, we looked over here as well as, yeah, but if you want to find, you know, people of color, you should be looking over there. Or what are your qualifications? A lot of times, you know, it was old boy network type stuff, somebody that Joe recommends. What's the deadline? Uh, you know, what do they need to present? You know, a lot of times they hadn't, they hadn't thought it out. So we didn't know how to get in. And so to kick it back to them, okay, well, if that's a deadline, I'll send some people there by that deadline and they'll bring this and then you can, you can decide. I never told people who to hire. I said, but here's people that meet what you say they should have and keep bouncing it back in that direction. The corporations, corporate control, Knight Ritter, Gannett, Times Mirror in those days uh, started diversity programs. So they would look from people like us to help them. Um, and at the beginning, at least, there weren't any other Chicanos. I guess me and Lewis were about the only two. And then Lewis left teaching fairly early. I don't think he got beyond, he became a stockbroker from what I heard. So he, he left academia. Um, so we would you know, rec recommend people to them, and then they would put the pressure on their local uh, newspapers. The first person anywhere who said, I'm looking for Chicanos, can you help me, was Phil Curry, 1978 at AEJ uh, convention in Seattle. He came up to me and said, if I came, came out from Rochester to New York, do you have some Chicanos I could interview in LA? And I said, yeah, and I also have some blacks and some Asians, if you want to. So a lot of times we couldn't get through the front door with a local editor. I found later, you know, they're getting pressure from the corporate to, you know, to get some diversity hiring there. Broadcasting was different because it was under federal regulation. And so they would go to these quota hires. You have to have one, maybe two, you know, things like that. Um, and they opened the door to, the door opened sooner in broadcasting because of the federal pressure. How do you think that the struggle for uh, diversity has changed uh, over your time in academia? Uh, what kinds of different things have cropped up or different routes it's taken? Well, it's, uh, it's gone from kind of a unidimensional on both sides to multidimensional on both sides. I mean, diversity started out as really a black and white issue. And then on the race thing, you know, and then blacks and others, other minorities are black, you know, and it's become more certainly more, more diverse in terms of uh, races, ethnicities, uh, religions. Uh, I think we didn't see a lot of pairing with the women's movement at the beginning, and now that's folded in. Sexual orientation was an issue that wasn't raised at all, but I can recall, till 1990 or so. Um, so we've kind of seen it as a wider movement now. And I think that was, that had to happen. I don't think that was bad. I think we had to learn our own base. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't latch on to the black movement, you know, could see you know, for them and all that, but I got to get my base covered too. And Asians and Native Americans and others, you know, now, uh, you know, Middle Easterners and such, South Asians. So you have to know your home, you know, your, your home turf, and then you can form coalitions. And the country is much more racially diverse, at least by census figures, close to 40% now, 37, 38, I think, in the last census than it was. But on the other side, so has the media changed. The media, you know, it was print and broadcasting. It was newspapers and TV stations and some radio and some magazines and that. But now with the, not just internet, but the growth of class media, the segmentation in radio, cable TV, um, film, all that, you know, they're, they're not trying to get the mass audience in there. Every station or every outlet is pinpointed. So you've seen a growth of ethnic and targeted publications and targeted segments within that. And that's been the biggest change. Um, and journalism and education, I do not think, has reflected that well. I think they're still working 
uh, too much on an integration model. How do we get you into NBC or the New York Times? So then those are great places to work, but there's also, you know, Univision. <laughs> there's also all these other places you can go. There's the Asian language newspapers. There's things like that, you know, and, and they need to reflect the breadth of opportunities that where students' language, cultural skills can be helpful to them. Uh, you know, we could end up um, integrating. It's kind of like when blacks became mayors of big cities in the late 60s. But being a big city mayor wasn't the influential position it was at one time because the white flight to the suburbs. We could end up integrating newspapers and network TV and at a time when the audiences are going in other directions and so are the advertisers. And journalism education's biggest challenge now is to reflect that diversity of media and match it with the diversity of uh, the student population coming to it. What do you think as far as uh, academia and diversity there, what would you say is the scene that confronts right now? I don't, I don't, uh, I guess it's because I just retired. <laughs> I don't put any blame on the higher ed. Let's put it this way. I think if you get your degree and you get your professorship and, you know, yeah, you're going to have battles to fight. And yes, there's going to be people that aren't going to understand what you want to do or why you want to do it or why it's important for you to do it and all that stuff. But you just got to be able to stake out your own, your own turf. I mean, you know, they can take you so far. In the end, you got to you got to you know run the rest of the race yourself and make alliances where you can. That's where for me AEJ has been so important. It may not count to where I work, what I'm doing, but there's a group over here that are doing the same thing on their campuses, and there and through them I get strength, and from them I can get some you know relationship, or from them I can get some learning, from them I can you know help them and they can help me. So uh, yeah, higher education, you know is in a state of change, one is that it's fantastically expensive. I went to Cal State LA as I lived at home the all five years I was there. The tuition, the total tuition for a whole semester of classes was $47. That was it. Now you didn't have to pay for books and that class of books for a semester could cost you as much as $25. But as long as you had $75, you could pay the parking, you get in. Well, you know, now students come in, they, they have to amass these tremendous debts. They come in to, um, and so they have to make more conscious choices of where they go and based on income, they, they leave school with tremendous debt loads that we didn't have. I had a little, but not much, uh, after Northwestern. And uh, professors, I fear, I mean, the one thing you do in higher ed is teach that you can't do someplace else. You can write, you can consult, you can, you know, do all this other speeches, you know, other platforms. And I see pressure on higher ed pulling people away from teaching, away from classes, away from the hands-on with the students. But in the end, you've got to make your own future and confront um, when you can. I don't think people should be afraid to battle to raise issues, to challenge, and then to produce. And I know that um, the surveys, the studies, and the atmosphere in America racially seem to indicate that we're getting more polarization again. It seems like racism is rising uh, and uh, people are uh, ejecting race negatively in, in a way that hasn't been seen for a period of years uh, in some interesting arenas, media, politics, etc. Um, how do you feel about where uh, things are uh, as far as our country in the idea of diversity and the kinds of uh, ramifications that has for the Academy of Journalism? Well, we're at a very critical point. See, as long as you're looking at a minority-majority situation and whites are the majority, and an integration approach where the minorities are trying to show they can be white or how much they can be or how much they can adapt white. Basically, they have that, not really white, wasp, you know, Anglo mentality. They're in control. They control who gets in, who gets up, what the conditions are and all this stuff. When the numerical relationships change, 
uh, then that's seen as a, as a threat. I don't know how, you know, I mean, this is a nation of uh, people who came from someplace else for the most part, although in the case of my, at least my, my father's side of the family, the U.S. came to us in California as a form of the Army, Navy, Marines in 1847 and 6 and declared war. But anyway, we found ourselves here in Azusa, my, where my grandfather lived. And, uh, you know, they've been able to expand. But it was expansion by people anglicizing themselves in the Europeans changing their names because they were white, so they would look more white than Polish or Irish or whatever. Now you have people who physically look different and are not going to, you could change your name, but you're still going to look Asian or you're still going to be black or whatever. Uh, and whether or not they can expand that participation to a wide enough uh, circle and understand it. Yes, this, I mean, here we are in Montreal. You see signs in French and English. Next to them, nobody doesn't hurt anybody, helps everybody, as a matter of fact. What's wrong with seeing signs in, you know, multiple languages in the United States? Well, some people, they want that English only type of thing. I think that someday, like just as we uh, pay tribute to the Underground Railroad of slaves, and you know, somebody in the future, they'll look at the routes from coming north from Latin America in the United States, and the way stations that people have had to stop in as people send their children to safety or brought themselves along in a similar line. You go back 40 years ago when Vietnam was, uh, when the U.S. was pulling out of Vietnam, and the the way the boat people and the boat children, these were parents putting their kids onto boats, their babies onto boats, so they could get safety in the United States. You have the same phenomenon happening today in Central America. People putting their children into a situation where they can be transported to safety in the United States. But in the Vietnam situation, or Cambodians and others, Laos, you know, people were welcoming, they were looking to adopt the kids, to bring the families up. Yeah, I haven't seen any of that here, it may be happening but I haven't seen reporters get these kids and just send them back to the places to, you know, where they're not going to be safe, where their parents are trying to help them escape. I mean, these parents should be, you know, looking to help their kids. We should be on our end looking to help them as well. So there's a tension. Uh, we lose in the end of the mass media, and going to the class media, the target segment of media, is you don't have the common ground that you once had. Now, very often, the common ground didn't include us or included us only as we made trouble or were seen as troublemakers or as colorful people on festivals and things like that. But at least everybody related to the Walter Cronkite or Huntley Brinkley or whatever. Now you see people seeking out media, which is basic communication research that reinforce their own viewpoints and standpoints. And I think that's going to continue. On the one hand, we have the opportunity for our own media to grow. And they are. On the other hand, people on the other side have their media to grow and reinforce their their attitudes and their views. So it is, it's surprising how polarizing it's become. Is there uh, anything you'd like to add to conclude the interview today? Well, um, I guess the biggest, the three roles I've had that have been the biggest factor have been as a teacher, a scholar, and an advocate. And I think that anybody who's in journalism education and committed to advancing inclusiveness and diversity needs to play all of those roles. You do have to be a good teacher, and, or as good a teacher as you can be, and you know, work for your students and connect, because that's, that's what we're there for. But uh, as a scholar, academic, you need to be able to document, to not just go beyond the rhetoric and to, you know, come up with substantive information that other people can include. And, you know, look, I'll read a textbook and they'll cite stuff that I or others have done. I said, well, that's good. And we've produced textbooks with, you know, I came up through the Latino angle, but the, the book that Clinton Wilson and I did and now with Lena Chow is race, ethnicity, racism, sexism, the media with Asians, Latinos, Native Americans, blacks, and now we do Middle Easterners and such. It was the first book that brought together all these groups as a textbook and said, well, where are their experiences the same? Where are they different? Looking for common ground. So you define the field as a scholar and contribute to it. 
Part of it's a broad sweep and part of it's building block. My generation was the broad sweep because we didn't know the basic nuts and bolts of things. Now this next generation can get the little pieces in there and, and do that, and they are doing that well. And then you always have to be an advocate. You cannot, you can't sleep, you can't take it in. The things, the situation normal is. And so looking for ways to help others, looking for ways to raise issues, helping others see the world the way you see it, and how you've experienced and others how like you have experienced it. I mean, some of the hardest working students I have have been the dream students, the students who are here without any papers. With, they can stay in the U.S. as long as they were going to school, but no expectation they would get a job or be able to get a job when they got out. They're supposed to go back to Mexico where they'd left when they were two or three years old. But they, I mean, they were just really believed that somehow they could do it and with this Obama executive order, they at least have a chance for a few years. So how do they look to others? How are they communicating with each other? Dr. Felix Gutierrez, thank you so much for okay. being a uh, guest today. All right, thank you.